Thank you so much for joining me to talk about your memoir, The Magical Language of Others. It was so incredible. Tell us the themes you were exploring. The short version is, is that, um, you know, I, my parents moved to South Korea when I was a teenager and we spent uh, quite a bit of time apart. I would say seven years till they came back, but nine before we reunited. And in that time, my mother wrote me letters in Korean uh, every week. And I couldn't, I didn't know Korean then the way I know it now as a translator. And so I discovered those letters after, uh, you know, putting them aside for so many years and I translated them. And the book is sort of bridged by these letters from my mother and my youth and um, my coming to poetry. So cool. Yeah. I, and those letters are included in the book. Um, it, they were beautiful to see. The f a phrase that comes up a lot is this Korean belief that you are born the parent of the one you hurt the most. Um, how did that phrase inspire you as you were writing it? And has writing this book brought you any closer to your Korean and Japanese cultures? That first comes from a poem I wrote in my poetry collection, A Lesser Love, and it's a, in a poem about my father. And what happened was we were at a restaurant having chicken katsu and he says that he tells me this this belief and says that he feels deep down that i might be the reincarnation of his father which i think says a lot of things i think it says that he he feels he owes me something or that maybe he's paid for something i, I think it also says that maybe we met each other because of that pain between us needed to be resolved. And I think it also says that, it says that he expects something from me in some way, um, even if it's that, whether it's my forgiveness of him or his own forgiveness of himself. But at the end of the poem, the thing I realize, um, just as his daughter is, is if we don't give each other pain if we don't um, create this unresolvable relationship between us, then I'll never see him again in the case of reincarnation. And I find, and, and I, that those themes just resonated with me because I don't think, um, uh, I don't think reincarnation is, is something to think about in one, one tone. Or it, it has so many shades to it. And, um, there's, there's separation and there's reunion. And I, I, I think in terms of how it works in the memoir is that it is the first line of the memoir because it says that our lives are all entangled mm -hmm. and they've been entangled since before we were born. And the, the living of these lives, of my life, is going to become a way to unentangle this entanglement. And whatever I choose to do or decide now um, has an effect not only on the future, which we understand, I think, but on the past. There's something that is done for the past in my present. It, it, it's really interesting. And I think there's a lot of Han that comes up. I don't think I ever directly say it, but it's something that was um, oh, I almost used it as a, a way of writing the scenes or getting to the emotion of the scenes was mm -hmm. Han. And Han is sort of this untrans considered untranslatable, inexpressible sadness. Um, and, and, and it's much more than that. But the thing I want to add to that is it's also the gap between whether something can be resolved and not resolved. And that gap is really where um, these stories and these lives exist, I think. For sure. Um, I love what you said about that phrase. I think that's going to stick with me, that if we don't have pain between us, then we can't see each other again, I think is a beautiful way to look at it. Um, 
And I think that was why I liked your memoir so much was because I think that's for some people like myself, it's kind of a hard lesson to learn that the, that you can feel pain with someone and still have extreme love for them and all that they are. Um, when you were translating your mom's letters, did it help bring out memories also that you included in the memoir? It's so interesting because so much of the letters were translated during the events in the memoir. Mm -hmm. So there's this, you know, when I'm, I, I believe when, when I go to the writing retreat with my mother, I'm still translating the letters. Mm. When I visit my parents' new house, uh, I'm still translating her letters and I'm still working on the memoir when, when I moved to Alki in West Seattle. And so what's, what's interesting is when we put the, the time frame of the memoir um, against sort of what's going on in my real life, there's this cross-hatching effect. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's all sort of happening at once, which is really interesting because it, it's so recent and up to the very end of the memoir is so close to when I was finishing the memoir. Mm. sense mm -hmm. um, the, the, the way time works and the way with the translation works it's it, it's so slow in the beginning and then it all speeds up in the last two or three chapters so that I finish the translations in the memoir and I'm I'm also just like finishing this this point in my life but sort of getting back to what you were talking about I think when I was translating the letters, the things I remember the most have to be reading them for the first time. Mm -hmm. When I was in my adolescence. And I think some of that made it into the memoir, but I know that, I think that's what it was. When I was translating the letters, I was also seeing myself reading them and, and remembering some of the lines and, and now it has this new meaning to it I didn't understand. And now it, I can read between the lines where, as I couldn't before. And in terms of the emotional weight, I think I recall how much these letters meant to me and whether I could read them or understand them fully, how much just having them near me was, was it, how it meant so much, mm, yeah. Very cool. I loved this section about you going to Japan to learn to speak Japanese. Um, and you wrote about how you, you didn't feel alone for the first time being there. Um, do you feel like when you're speaking another language or when you're translating like different versions of yourself come up or is it just all the same person? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've been thinking about this and I don't I think the honest answer is I don't quite know. Mm -hmm. But I but what where I tend toward and whether this answer might change is that I don't feel like I'm by learning another language I'm becoming different. It's more that I'm accessing a part of myself that was unrevealed. Mm -hmm. it, it's like I'm becoming more whole and those parts that are revealed through learning another language are in, they're in fact myself they just weren't um, easily like easily seen mm -hmm. and that's why I think learning a language is so for me it was just so so vital to understanding um, who I was and my, my place in the world. And I think it's also part of why I love people who love books and writing and who love to read and who, who can write in, in other languages or who translators. I think there's something really magical going on there. And in terms of just the moment in Japan, you know, I was coming from Davis and my high school at the time, it, there was a 
not a lot of students that I could connect to like like me. And when I went to Japan, you know, I was with Korean Americans, I was with Koreans, I was with Korean Japanese, Chinese. Um, there was a sort of diversity in in a way that I that was still new to me. And so having a learning environment as well as having that diversity, it was a uh, it was new and welcoming, I think. Definitely. What's, what also makes your memoir special is you include all these scenes that you weren't, that you couldn't see firsthand. Um, like you describe your maternal grandmother's early life in South Korea and your um, paternal grandmother's coming of age in Tokyo. And I read in an interview that you did that these family stories had kind of become bedtime stories when you were little and that mm -hmm. you realize that those bedtime stories sometimes ended in a tragic way. Um, I wondered, I know you've been asked this before, but I just find it so interesting. What were kind of the sources that helped you piece together scenes that you weren't there for? And um, how did you kind of talked about this, but how do you add feeling to those, like tap into the feelings of those scenes? Yeah, definitely. I am. Um, so what helps me a lot is is my method of research for Han. Um, when I study about Han, um, it's so tough to study something that isn't something you can grasp. Mm -hmm. It's almost like air. It's everywhere, and it's everywhere but also elusive and there's you're not going to find as much recorded about Han because of its constancy it's such a obvious part of of life and and so what I use with Han is a lot of uh, work with tracing and that's just allowing I, I mean a part of that is is finding any trace and following that to the very end and also using association or surprise, which is letting myself along the way point, get pointed somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I think so, so much of our work in research is we have this, and, and it's good, I think it's good you have this sort of vision or idea, but I think it's not good to be inflexible about it. It's to sort of go down the line and be, be sort of willing to change your mind halfway through and change your method halfway through. So I do a lot of work with history and then cinematic stuff, like, you know, a lot of um, movies and I will do work with translation. I think it's important to read across languages if that's, you know, available. And there's translated works too and textbooks that work great. Uh, interviews, a lot of testimonial research. I mean, just getting the chance to talk to people has such a, a large impact on, on your work. Well, for me, it did an understanding things like myths and traditions and, and fairy tales. The, those, those things really um, give, give body to the work. But I would say the thing I've learned is you can only bring yourself so far with that research. And at, and at a certain point, I have to sort of slow it down. Uh, I think it's like right before you feel like you have everything to slow it down and say, when does you know the daughter come back in? When do I come mm -hmm. back in? And say, all this research doesn't have to make it into the memoir. It doesn't have to make it to the page. You know, that's separate. What needs to make it onto the page is going to to be more about the people and about these characters and their lives. And, and so I try to emphasize that. There was a paragraph that was so poetic and kind of mythical when I was reading it about your grandfather's passing. Um, and in this paragraph, you write a few different versions of what may have caused his car accident. Um, what I loved that you allowed yourself to explore that. Um, was how, What did you rely on for those gaps in what you might not have known? What happened? Yeah, I think although the way the story is told to me about um, my mother's father's death after the fishing trip and he falls into the creek, something about it is so determined 
that for me, when I was writing this, this scene, I really wanted to ask questions of what was he feeling? What was he looking forward to? And um, what's different, you know? And I wasn't looking for a single answer, but a picture of all the possibilities. And I find that really important. It's like once you have all the possibilities on the table, then you, you might have captured something. And, and I think poetry works in this beautiful way because it leaves room for the reader. It leaves room for possibility. And that's always important because because if I, if I determine that scene, then what I do is instead of opening and creating possibility, I close that event down on itself instead of allowing not only space for him and my family, but also for myself, for this story to sort of carry on. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of good writing does that. It, 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 it sort of is able to travel through time so well because it never closes. Mm -hmm. The closing is always on behalf of the reader, not on the writer. Definitely. I think that's what one of the things that makes your memoir so magical to read. I didn't realize I just made that pun, but we're going to go with it. Um, <laughs> is because you're traveling through all these different generations. And as even though you're, you know, you're saying what happened, it's it doesn't feel like a definite recording. There's all this room for um, sort of possibility and it's hard to explain, but whatever you just said, <laughs> I think is in your book and you do it so well. Um, I also really appreciated how honest you were about how self-harm has appeared in your family uh, over generations. Why was it important to you to be honest about that and kind of examine inherited trauma, if that's the way you would put it? Yeah. So I have a history of self-harm and my mother has a history of self-harm and you know, it turns out so does my, my grandmother. And it's, it was one way for me to see the momentum of that harm and not just on the level of, of myself and what I'm wrestling with, but to sort of take my perspective back. And I think when, when I did that, it really gave me the stakes, right? It's not just me hurting myself. Um, this, this thing I do, it has consequences um, for the past and the future. And it's all in this moment, right? It's, it's no longer this um, singular thing. And it helped me understand the role of intergenerational trauma as not something that you can that can come to a complete cessation, mm -hmm. but it's something that you can slowly um, um, spin for this opportunity of reversal so that um, going forward, right, the, the, the momentum and the energy you put toward is in, is in healing or it's in, in facing up to it differently and knowing that, that the power to do that really lies, lies with me right now. Um, it was really interesting to, I don't think I, I meant to at first, but that's where I was led to in terms of, of the heroines. And, and I guess there's a lot of caricatures of, of her, heroines, but I think this, they are heroines, but they're also just full and complete people who have, you know, hurt themselves and have also done done things with regret and then they felt extreme sadness and have issues with love and issues with identity but they're also still heroic right there was, there was just this part of me that wanted to see them whole yeah for sure i think as your reader what i took away that i found so helpful was i feel like when we're trying to write about if we're drawing from family experience or we kind of, or at least I do this, I end up getting trapped in the looking for answers thing. And, and, and I think that can put a roof on it. And so what I appreciated so much about your memoir was that there can be kind of this unknowing quality and this unlike 
ungraspable quality, if that's a word, and that that's okay, and that you can just write your feelings towards whatever that is, um, which is a valuable lesson for me, um, when, which is kind of contradictory to what I'm about to ask you, but when you were going into it, did you start with questions, and did your perspective on your mother or grandmother change after doing all this work? I think um, one clue to that might be might be the way I organize the chapters. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the chapter with um, when I'm visiting my mother in Pundam for the first time, we end that chapter with her asking about um, her own mother, you know, and I think that was important because for me in that moment, you know, in the first chapters, I'm saying to everyone, if you want to know me, you have to know my mother. And my mother, I go to my mother, and what my mother is saying to me in that moment is, if you want to know who I am, you have to know my mother. And that is, in the very, um, you know, the following chapter is the chapter with Jun and Lee. So we even, we not only go back into the story of her mother, but we're in her mother's perspective. I think the same thing occurs with the chapter when I'm in Japan. I go there searching for community and, I'm, and you know, things go a little crazy. We're all sort of young and we have these ideas of the war and what happened. And you might think, what, what is she doing here? What, what does this have to do with everything that's going on at present? And what follows is Kumiko's chapter. It's about her, her story going from um, from from Japan to Jeju Island to mainland South Korea and then later to the United States. It has everything to do with everything. And so I, I think the way I organized it was I would I would let the questions lead me to what the next yeah. chapter should try and discover and explore. And the the way that book is organized is the order in which the chapters were written. And I think um, it, it, it's thought that I sort of wrote it separately and then put them together, but it was really the way my mind was working and it made sense to me. So I wanted to keep it that way. Yeah. So cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today and being a part of our series. Yeah. This is your beautiful book. Once again, so amazing. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to read the book, to be so open to it, and to conduct this interview, and just remind me and, and hopefully everybody that you know, writing is a form of, of learning. Writing is a form of research. It's a lot of I don't know, and that's great. You know, like that's totally okay. And what comes out is we still might not know, but we get to sort of share our emotions and experiences. And that's like just beautiful on its own. Thank you. For sure. You've given me hope and inspired me and I appreciate it. <laughs> Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.